Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, well, so the title that that I was given was walking through the lab door, uh, what it's like to be a Christian uh, and a scientist. And before I, uh, before I talk to you about that though, uh, Dean Hutchinson gave you some picture of my academic background here at Rice, but you know, my time at Rice here, I wasn't just an academic and I thought I would take this opportunity to share with you the actual high point of my entire undergraduate experience at Rice. Uh, so I, I dug through and I found the only guide from 1996, um, and you'll see that this is the page on beer bike. You'll see that it was, uh, you know, uh, the, the agony and the ecstasy of beer bike. Oh, okay, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll give it, I'll give it one more minute, and then if not, I'll just stand at the podium the whole time. Uh, so if you see this, I'll stand at the podium. <laughs> so you see the. Okay, that. There we go. So you see in the picture there, agony and ecstasy. Now, but if you zoom in on the lower left-hand corner, there you go. You see some folks really racing hard. You see one dude that's way right out in front of everybody else. That's me. <laughs> I led a lap of beer bike when I was at Rice University. That was the high point of my time here. Now, just lest, before you should get too overly impressed with me, this is, this is a photograph of the first lap uh, <laughs> coming into the front straightaway. And I'm very grateful that the photographer took the picture when they did, because it's about 45 seconds into the race. Uh, and by 55 seconds into the race, I had been passed by that guy, that guy, that guy, that guy, and that guy. So my lead didn't last long enough, but it lasts long enough for them to take a picture. So. All right, so that's uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm here, though, to talk about what it's like to be a scientist and a Christian, um, and what happens when you walk through the lab door. Now, I really like that title. I have to confess that I didn't come up with the title. Uh, it was suggested to me by the student organizers, but I really like it because it captures something of the mystery of what it's like to be a scientist. Because particularly if you're a non-scientist, becoming a scientist is kind of like joining a secret society. I mean, like, you know, they go into the lab, they do something in there, but what are they really doing in there? Uh, and because there's so much mystery, and in fact, I would say misinformation uh, about what being a scientist is actually like, I want to start off by deconstructing two myths uh, about what happens when a Christian goes into the lab. So there's two myths I want to deconstruct. The first myth uh, is the myth that being a Christian necessarily makes you a worse scientist. So the idea here is that there are certain aspects of Christianity, things like the belief in an, an omnipotent, all-loving, supernatural being, and that these beliefs make it difficult, if not impossible, to do good science. The myth says that a Christian worldview is nothing more than a bias that will cripple your ability to think critically about the world around you. In short, the perception is that being a Christian marks you as inferior. In this way, it's much like going to UT. I'm going to have some fun up here. So, so the argument, this argument, though, it's, it's been championed by a number of folks, people like Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett, Samuel Harris, people who, call it, who go by the moniker of the new atheists, or as I sometimes like to call them, the evangelical atheists. And there's a kernel of truth here. And that kernel of truth is that in order to do science, it requires that the scientist be an objective observer. If I do an experiment and I collect data and then I analyze that data in a biased way. For example, by deleting the data points that don't agree with the conclusion I want to draw, the result is not simply bad science, it is not science. You know, if, if I run a rea chemical reaction and I find that I got 125% yield, I might react by saying, God has suspended the law of conservation of mass in the middle of my OCHEM lab 
Hallelujah, I deserve an A plus plus for my performance. That would not be science, because I would have used my bias, namely my desire to get a good grade in OPEM, to discard a, more, a plausible explanation, namely that I had mismeasured the amount of starting material for the reaction, in favor of a less plausible interpretation. And this kind of bias is called confirmation bias. It's our natural human tendency to interpret information in a manner that confirms our expectations or our hopes. And science cannot exist in the presence of confirmation bias. Doing science requires me to report and analyze my data in an objective and unbiased manner, even if doing so leads to conclusions that I do not like. Now, any form of theism is biased from a scientific perspective because I cannot scientifically demonstrate that God exists. Likewise, any form of atheism is also biased because I cannot prove that God does not exist. Likewise, people who like Justin Bieber are biased because there's no scientific justification for being a believer. <laughs> but these biases do not prevent me from doing good science unless they also lead me to confirmation bias. And the central tenet of Christianity, namely the existence of God, is quite secure uh, from conservation bias. Because while I do have a preconceived notion that God exists, I am never going to be able to interpret my data as proving that because I also have a preconceived notion that science is never going to prove or disprove the existence of God. And so you can believe in Yahweh or Jesus or Allah or Buddha or Krishna or the flying spaghetti monster and still do great science. And in case you didn't know, the flying spaghetti monster is an actual thing. You can Google it. Uh, the followers of the flying spaghetti monster are known as Pastafarians. Um, it's, Google it, it's true. I didn't make it up. But that, so all this is to say that you can have a wide range of biased viewpoints that don't lead to confirmation bias uh, that can still allow you to do great science. And that's not to say that religious people never make error in this. It's not, it's not to say that religious people never fall prey to confirmation bias in doing science. It's just that those people are not properly applying the principles of Christian thought. Because in Christianity, we don't go out and examine the natural world in order to find confirmation of the God that we already knew was there. We go out to find evidence of God as he actually is. And so, I am far from the first person to think this way, so lest you should give me too much credit for this. Historically, we should not forget that the scientific method was pioneered by scholars who employed an explicitly Judeo-Christian worldview. The logic was that if the world was created by God, and if God is rational, then it follows that the world should make sense. As Isaac Newton put it, it is the perfection of God's works that they are all done with the greatest simplicity. He is the God of order, and not of confusion. And we shouldn't take this for granted, because if God was a flying spaghetti monster, then the universe would probably be considerably more confusing than it already is. So that's the first myth, the idea that being a Christian makes you a worse scientist. The second myth is the first myth just turned on its head. It's the idea that being a scientist makes you a worse Christian. The idea that somehow scientific thought is a threat to good, solid Christian belief. Now, here, the general idea is that there are observable facts that Christians are supposed to stand for. Things like, how old is the universe? What are the origins of species? Does the earth revolve around the sun, or the sun revolve around the earth? And the perception is that the difference between science and faith just boils down to which description of events you think is correct. You know. Scientists think the universe is this old, Christians think it's that old. Scientists believe in trilobites, Christians don't believe in trilobites. Scientists like Coke, Christians like Pepsi. <laughs> and so, according to the myth, becoming a scientist just means, it means abandoning your Christian principles. Now, I make light, and I, I tell a lot of jokes, but this is a significant pain point for a lot of Christians. And so, we need to tread lightly uh, in our time discussing it. See, in Christianity, most of the arguments uh, about science are based on biblical scriptures. Now, as a Christian, I believe the Bible is true, and I also believe that the Bible contains a great deal of evidence about God's action in the natural world. But I'm not sure many of you know what I actually mean by that, and so I have an activity for us, an, an interactive activity. And so uh, those of you in the audience who have a cell phone, laptop, tablet, anything with a web browser, 
I want you to fire it up and go to Socrative.com uh, and enter that room number. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow me to ask you guys some questions, and then we are all going to be able to see the responses of the group uh, to the questions in real time. Now, I'll give you fair warning that all of these questions are going to have to do with the first chapter of Genesis. Uh, this is a very famous passage of scripture, but in case you're not familiar with it, it starts out at the very beginning of the Bible and says, in the beginning, God created the heavens of the earth, and the earth. And then it proceeds to lay out God creating oceans and animals and plants and people. And it divides this action up into seven days. Uh, and, and the first part of Genesis chapter two, it says that on the seventh day, God rested. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a series of questions about this passage. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to answer in a very particular way because what I don't want to know what you think about Genesis chapter one. Okay, this is not an opinion poll, it's not a popularity contest. Instead, I want you to think about this. And what I want you to think about is I want you to pretend that you think Genesis chapter one is true. Now, that may be the case for some of you. Some of you may say, yes, I'm on board with that. Other of you guys are like, no, I absolutely don't think that. But for the next five minutes, just bear with me. Say that you think Genesis chapter 1 is true and answer these questions accordingly. So now we'll switch over to Socrative uh, and see if we can actually do that. Let's see. That's all right. It's resisting. I see, I see it. Okay. So yeah, I'll scoot the window over so we can see a little better. And then... Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. So I just told you the. Uh... Oh, it went away. All right, there we go. All right, so the, f whoa, whoa, okay. I can read that, can you guys read it? Okay, so first question is, if Genesis one is true, then the earth was created in seven days. And it's not listing the responses on there, but the two responses are easy. They are A, true, B, false. Okay, so if Genesis 1 is true, is true, then the earth was created in seven days. A is true, B is false. Let's see what we've got here. Okay, I'm going to give you 10 more seconds. Those of you who really want to vote for false, get in there so that you can even out the scores. Otherwise, true is going to win. <laughs> All right, so we have a majority saying true, but not a vast majority. So I have a follow-up question for you on this. Uh, and that follow-up question, so next question. Hide live results probably for now. How confident of you, are you of your answer? So I forced you, of course. I said, you can only say true or false. You can't say maybe or sort of or yes, if you can think of it this way, you had to say true or false. So how confident are you that, yeah, it's true, yeah, it's false. So one is going to be very, very confident. Two is somewhat confident. Three is not confident. Four is going to be I was probably wrong. <laughs> so now let's see some results. You want to go ahead and show? Go. All right. So we've got some, some very confidence, all the way down to a few people who want to change their answer because they think they were probably wrong. Okay, so now I have one final question uh, about Genesis chapter 1. You can go ahead and put it up. This one gets to the heart of things, what it means to be a chemist, because it's a question about significant digits. Okay? So, so I went and I looked up the length of a day in seconds. 
Turns out a day is 86,164.09 plus or minus 0.01 seconds. That's one stellar day. So if I multiply that, se that by seven, uh, then I would say if Genesis chapter one is true, the heavens and the earth were created in 603,148 plus 0.63 plus or minus 0.03, propagating my errors properly, seconds. So how many people think that's, now I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna be nice, I'm giving you three possibilities. True, false, Maybe, okay, so you've got three, three things there. <laughs> All right, so. So you can see that just by changing it from days to seconds uh, and giving it a, sl a slightly higher edge of precision, a number that we've already, I think, got as many falses as before, and just about everybody who, just most of the people who had said true have switched over to maybe. Um, and so what, I, so what do I want you to take away from this? So what I want you to take away from this that, is that even a simple passage like Genesis chapter 1 requires interpretation. Okay, so I asked you these questions and I told you you're all supposed to pretend like you have the same view of the passage that it's true and you guys did not get 100% agreement on any of these questions. Okay, and the hermeneutic by which we interpret scripture is not set in stone. It's not part of any confession of faith, any catechism or any creed. It's something that most Christians work at throughout their lives. lives. And so while scientific, scientific evidence can certainly challenge certain interpretations of scripture, that's quite a different thing from scientific evidence challenging scripture itself. Okay, but this goes both ways because scientific evidence also requires interpretation. Some of you guys probably don't believe me right now, don't you? You think, no, it doesn't. Science is Observations, that's it. Science is things like there were 206 bo bones in the human body or sodium reacts vigorously with air. That's science, that doesn't require interpretation. But that's actually not all of science because science is not just facts. So Henri Poincaré said it well when he said science is made up of facts. Just as houses are built of stones, so science is made of facts. But a pile of stones is not a house. And a collection of facts is not necessarily science. Because science is more than just a collection of observations about the physical world. Science is the business of taking those observations and shaping them, interpreting them, and giving them meaning. Let me give you an example of how this works. So suppose you were a farmer and you stored up your, your crop of corn in the summer and you made some cornmeal and you put a bag of, of cornmeal away from the winter and then you sent someone to go get the cornmeal for you because you were hungry and they came back to you and they said, I've got some bad news for you. That bag of cornmeal is now full of maggots. It's a terrific image, isn't it? A bag full of maggots. All right, so that is a scientific observation. It's a fact. The bag is full of maggots. I want to know how you interpret that fact, and we're going to use Socrative to do that. And if it's not, it's not going to, if it's not going to display the answers, I, let, let me tell you what the four possible answers are going to be. All right, so if someone tells you maggots form in cornmeal, how do you interpret this? Okay, option one. Option one is this is clearly the action of a supernatural being. Okay, that's option one. Option two is they are lying. The evidence has been falsified. Maggots do not form in cornmeal. Option three is this is a natural phenomenon. Air and cornmeal naturally come together to make maggots. It's a chemical reaction, air plus cornmeal equals maggots. Option four is this is a natural phenomenon. Flies like to lay eggs in cornmeal and those eggs hatch and become maggots. So you have four options there. Which one is your interpretation of that result? All right, let's see here. <laughs> so, so I'll say that I run these types of competitions in my chemistry classes, and I've learned that you never get 100% agreement, because there's always someone who's like, well, I'm going to put it up for an answer down just to be funny. But this is about as close as you get to unanimous. So you guys all agree the answer is four. The flies have laid eggs in the cornmeal, and that's why there's maggots. And that's great. I ex fully expected you to agree on this one. And the only problem is that for about 2,000 years, 
The dominant scientific interpretation of this fact was not that flies lay eggs in the cornmeal and that's how you get maggots. The dominant scientific interpretation was the third one, which is that air and cornmeal come together to spontaneously make maggots. Uh, it's the theory of what's known as spontaneous generation, that under the right circumstances, inanimate objects can come together to produce life. Now, on the Christian side, contemporary with that, scholars looked at passages in the Bible, like the Israelites receiving quail in the desert, or a beehive, Samson finding a beehive in the carcass of a lion. They said, look at this. Here is scriptural evidence that spontaneous generation is right. Number three is clearly the answer. Everyone agreed. Theologians, Christians, scientists, they all said spontaneous generation. And then in the later part of the 19th century, Louis Pasteur came along and embarrassed everyone by showing that spontaneous generation is not the normal course of things. And the conclusion of that is not that the old experiments were, in scripture were wrong. They were not wrong. Somebody who comes and tells you that maggots form in cornmeal is telling you the truth. The observation is correct. It had just been misinterpreted. The old experiments hadn't been falsified because maggots do form in cornmeal, and Christians do continue to believe that the Israelites found quail in the desert. This information had just been misinterpreted. Life does not come out of non-life as a matter of course. When that happens, something unusual or even miraculous has happened. And so we see that science also requires interpretation. Now granted, the tools that we use to interpret scientific evidence are different than the tools we use to interpret scriptural evidence. But the interpretation is still a necessary part of science, and the process of interpretation is often messy. It involves lots of arguments. And I'm reminded of this every time I submit one of my papers for peer review, and I discover that it's apparent that the referees have a very different interpretation of my results than I do. And so Christianity, I think, has nothing to fear from science. Uh, to paraphrase Augustine, all truth is God's truth. We learn about God by interpreting all kinds of evidence, scriptures, historical events, scientific data. But the Christian worldview implies that all of this evidence must point to one and the same God. So those are the two myths I wanted to deconstruct there. Just, I don't know, maybe you, none of you guys subscribe to either of those myths, but I wanted to get those out of the way. And so now I want to go back uh, and I want us to talk uh, about the subtitle of this, which is, does the worldview matter? Does it even matter? Is having a Christian worldview even relevant to the work that one does in the lab? Or is it best to just take the two things and keep them separate? Well, I would argue that there are good reasons that this is not the right path to go. Uh, and I'd like to spend the rest of our time just discussing uh, why this is the case. So I want to discuss the integration of science and faith. And I have a, a cool picture. I think you have to go forward one more. Uh, so see, this is a nerd joke. See, integration of science and faith. <laughs> so I knew you guys would get that one. OK, so I want to organize this discussion around three questions. Um, the first question uh, is, that the, and these are all questions I think that science and faith together answer better than either one answers individually. So the first question that I want to discuss is, how does the universe work? That's the first question. The second question I want to address is, well, what is the universe for? And the third question I want to talk about is, well, what about me? Where do I fit into all of this? Because I am very important to myself. So the first question, how does the universe work? Well, I think it's important to realize straight from the beginning here that the science by itself gives us an incomplete picture of how the universe works. Because science is in the business of constructing laws that explain experimental observations. But as Ernst Mach, a philosopher of science once put it, the law always contains less than the fact itself. Because it does not reproduce the fact as a whole, but only that aspect which is important to us. So for example, I am a, a theoretical chemist. If I describe a protein in great detail, where all of the residues are, where all of the atoms sit within those residues, I, if I even get down to the subatomic level and describe the electronic structure of those atoms, still, it's not the protein itself. It's just a summary of information about the protein that I might think is important or interesting. Likewise, if I make a prediction about how the protein is going to behave, it's not as if my prediction is the thing that makes it happen. There's always something else that is active in scientific phenomena. 
And science is incomplete in part because it only gives one layer of meaning, one explanation, one kind of explanation to these physical events, whereas human beings typically seek different layers of meaning in different contexts. Let me give you a simple example of how this works. <clears throat> you might ask me, Troy, why is your shirt pink? And I might attempt to give you an explanation in this way. I might say my shirt is pink because there is a moderate concentration of the secondary diazo dye Congo red in the fibers that were used to weave my shirt. I could even attempt to prove this explanation by removing the dye from the shirt, thereby demonstrating a scientific chemical explanation for why my shirt is pink. I could try to explain this phenomenon in another fashion, however, by saying my shirt is pink because my white shirt is at the dry cleaners. Those are two explanations for the same phenomenon, my pink shirt. They are both correct, my white shirt is at the dry cleaners, but neither one is exclusive of the other. Now the explanations of science and faith typically coexist in the same kind of fashion. For example, we could ask a question, why do bacteria have flagella? And I could attempt to answer that question in a scientific manner by saying that, well, bacteria have flagella because of an evolutionary process. First, the secretory system arose, which gave rise to a proto-flagellar filament, which later evolved into the eubacterial flagellum that we know today. Another explanation that I could give would be bacteria have flagella because God wanted them to be able to swim. Now, you might ascribe one more importance or more significance to one or the other of these explanations, but they are both answers to the same question, different layers of meaning. And I find different layers of meaning profoundly important in motivating me. Okay, I want to do an old-fashioned pop quiz now, not with Socrative, just by show of hands. So get your hands ready here. So by show of hands, how many of you have taken an elective chemistry class. You thought, oh, I don't have to take it, but this sounds fun, chemistry. <laughs> wow, that is, re uh, that is really disappointing, guys. Really disappointing. I was expecting more at a place like Rice. All right, I'm going to ask a different question. How many of you in junior high, high school, or college took a required chemistry class? I kind of expected that, because chemistry has a motivation problem. <laughs> you see, most people don't take chemistry classes just because they're curious about the named reactions of organic chemistry. Typically, they need to some, attach some additional layer of meaning to learning chemistry. Now, often, that layer of meaning is simple. The meaning goes something like this. If I do not take this class, it means I will not graduate. Therefore, I am motivated to take chemistry. But for me, as a Christian, Christianity offers a much more attractive motivation for studying science. See, the fascinating thing for me is that chemistry describes a world that we cannot see. It's a world of atoms and molecules. It's a world that obeys different laws than the world I am used to living in. Now, I will never see a molecule. And yet, knowing about these molecules that I will never see helps me to understand the world that I can see. And in Christianity, we worship God, a person who I cannot see, but who helps me to make sense of the world that I can see. And there are things about this world of atoms and molecules for me that teach me about God, who, the God who created them, and the promise of learning more about God, it motivates me to learn more about chemistry because as Thomas Carlyle once said, this world, after all our science, is still a miracle, wonderful, inscrutable, magical, and more to whosoever will think on it. And so I feel that science and faith together give a much better motivation, a much better reason for exploring the question of how the universe works so now let's look on to the second question of what is the universe for? And I come to this question second because it's the natural follow-on because once we start to understand how the universe works, it gives us some degree of control about how things are going to turn out. You know, we get the control over saying, well, we could dam a river and generate hydroelectric power. We could put fluoride in the water to, to prevent cavities. We could put pesticides on the crop to increase their yields. And here, the different 
interpretations of science and faith provide and interact very deeply because while science guides us and tells us about the probable outcomes of these actions, faith is the thing that helps us evaluate which outcome we should actually pursue. Let me give you an example of this. Recently, uh, I've begun working on a team to design a massively open online course, or a MOOC, uh, for general chemistry. The idea behind a MOOC is to create a digital replica of a university level class, an MIT or Rice level course, and then offer it online for free to anyone who wants to take it. Now, in part, I've gotten involved in this just out of sheer curiosity. I mean, I'm a theoretician, I'm a computational chemist, and so I want, I'm curious, how well can we teach chemistry online with little or no face-to-face -face interaction with students? But in getting involved with this, I also think about the end game. Where is this MOOC thing going to lead? And I can foresee any of several scenarios. So um, on the one hand, I can see a really best case scenario. The best case scenario being where MOOCs give access to millions of people in the developing world. It gives them access to higher education that they never had before. So students in Mongolia can take electrical engineering from an MIT engineer. Students in Bangladesh can learn about Shakespeare from a professor in Oxford. That's the best case scenario, and it's a really awesome scenario. But it's not the only possible outcome. I could also have an outcome that's the worst case scenario, which is where someone takes what they learn in a, mo in a MOOC and uses it to hack into a credit card database, or to design a weapon, or to hurt someone. And then, of course, there's the more mundane middle-of-the-road scenarios, things like the fact that MOOCs could really change, transform, higher education in the United States. Because after all, why would you pay thousands of dollars to go to college if you can get the same information online for free? And in that scenario, uh, the thought is that places like MIT and Rice would get better and better because we would offer the best MOOCs and everyone would take them. But community colleges would go slowly extinct. Would this be a good outcome or a bad outcome? Well, with all these uncertain outcomes, what should I do? Is it worthwhile for me to design a MOOC, even a great one, or should I do something else? And it's my Christian worldview and not my skills as a scientist that allows me to attach value to these outcomes. Because, and I'm going to let you in on a little secret here, science allows scientists to be irresponsible. Let me explain what that means. Think about the biggest scientific discoveries of the last 100 years. You know, I'm thinking of things like the theory of relativity, the double helix, the chemical bond. We celebrate the great scientists that made those discoveries. We know their names. They're people like Einstein and Watson and Crick and Pauling. Now, on the flip side, think about the biggest scientific debacles of the last 100 years. Things like the atomic bomb, thalidomide, chlorofluorocarbons. Anybody know the names of the scientists associated with those or how those scientists were punished for the bad outcomes of their science? The answer is they were not punished for the bad outcomes of their science. And so you see, maybe for the first time, the strange pact that science has with society, which is that science gets all of the credit and none of the blame which encourages, or at least allows, scientists to be irresponsible because if it all goes pear-shaped, no one is going to blame me. I'm just the scientist. But the Christian faith binds together my scientific work and my ethical responsibility because they're both directed towards the same God. The things I study are both an intellectual exercise that's motivated by curiosity and also an ethical exercise aimed at pleasing God. And so if I feel like working on a MOOC is going to make me rich and famous beyond my wildest dreams, but is going to be harmful to the educational experience of students, I will not do it. Now, certainly others can motivate that kind of ethical behavior from other sources, rationalism, empiricism, naturalism. But in those cases, ethics is typically working in opposition to science. Ethics is the thing that limits our scientific inquiry. By contrast, Christianity provides a worldview where the two work in concert. Because the God who created the universe is the same God who directs us about how to influence it responsibly. And so I think that science and faith have a lot to do in terms of talking with each other about what the universe is for, what we should do with the universe that we have. And then finally, I want to talk about the question that's really of the most significance to me, which is, what about me? Where do I fit into all of this? 
And this is a question that science by itself is ill-equipped to deal with because the central tenet uh, of scientific inquiry is the, is the assumption, oh, well, I shouldn't say, the central um, problem with science is that it can never come up with truth that changes me as an individual. Because the central tenet of science is that truth is objective. That truth is an object that exists independent of its observation by the subject, namely me. And so science necessarily divorces the truth from the truth seeker. You know, in the most, one of the most beautiful passages of scripture, Jesus taught his disciples, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall sh set you free. The promise of modern science is the somewhat more mundane, you shall know the truth, but the truth will probably not have any perceptible impact on the way that you choose to behave. Because truth is out there, and I am in here. And this is particularly true in chemistry, because chemistry cannot change me as a person. Well, actually, okay, that's not quite true. Chemistry can change me, but not in ways that are legal outside of the states of Colorado and Washington. <laughs> All the ways that chemistry changes me as a person are out of bounds for the rules of academic inquiry, because we don't want the experiment to influence the observer. There's a reason in your chemistry labs that we told you not to taste the fine white powder that you made at the end of the experiment. It would change you. Just ask Walter White. <laughs> Are you making bad fans in the audience? Oh, okay. So chemistry, the result is that chemistry actually can change your life, but chemistry class, maybe not so much. And to my mind, this is a fundamental weakness of a purely scientific worldview because it possesses no power to transform people. And this is the place where faith becomes crucial, turning science from a cold, dead exercise into something that can be vibrant and life-giving. Now, to see why we need faith in order to accomplish this transformation, we first need to recognize that it is our convictions, the things that we are absolutely certain of. These are the things that govern our behavior. Because if I'm going to organize my life around an ideal or a principle, I want to be certain that that ideal or principle is true. If I am uncertain, I am liable to wait for more evidence to come in. And from a scientific perspective, this never works because there is always more evidence that could come in. I will wait and wait and wait, and I will never act. Because scientific evidence can give us greater and greater and greater confidence, but it can never entirely bridge the gap between indecision and action. There is always a gap. It might be a small gap, it might be a large gap, but there is always a gap. And that last step is always a step of faith. It need not be religious faith. You might have faith in humanity, or faith in a person, or faith in the laws of gravity. But we need faith in order to act uh, in, this, in the light of in, incomplete evidence. Because faith is the thing that gives us a framework for making these kinds of decisions. I don't know all the answers yet, but I need to act. I need some clarity and certainty. For example, let me give you a concrete example. Suppose I feel that there is convincing scientific evidence that human activity is contributing significantly to climate change. Now, I'm not arguing that this is actually the case. I'm just saying suppose that I think that. But while I am convinced that human beings are making climate change worse, I still drive an SUV. I still leave the incandescent light bulbs in my house on when I am not there. I crank up the air conditioning in the summer. I fly tens of thousands of miles each year for vacations. In this scenario, I would say that while I am convinced, I am not certain. Because if I was certain, I would change my behavior. The fact that I persist in activities that produce large amounts of carbon dioxide says that either, a, I am not certain that what I am doing contributes significantly to global climate change, or B, that I am certain, but I am a fundamentally evil person who does not care about the future of the planet, the security of our country, or the well-being of my own children. I hope you would think that the answer is not B, but the, what the Christian faith recognizes is that in order to gain the kind of certainty we need in order to make decisions and to act in the face of this incomplete information, it matters very much who is making the request of us. And this is not the case in science or in much of academia. In science, it doesn't, or at least it shouldn't matter, who wrote the book or who wrote the article. The thing that matters is what's in the book or what's in the article. 
But in the case of action decisions, the source matters a great deal. If my wife were to text me and tell me to leave $100 in the mailbox, I would do it without needing any further explanation. However, if one of you texted me and said I needed to leave $100 in the mailbox, I would report you to the authorities. <laughs> because the source matters. And in Christianity, there is a person behind all of this, a person that motivates our study of the natural world, enlightens scripture for us, guides our responsible conduct, and that person is Jesus. As Christians, we are convinced that when we place our faith in Christ, then the person of Jesus, who was raised from the dead, comes to live in us. And fundamentally, what I believe in is the power of that relationship to change me, to change who I am. And let me explain to you why that is so important to me. You see, in junior high and high school, I was a geek. Now, I know that's shocking. <laughs> you're probably all sitting there thinking, you're a quantum chemistry professor at MIT, and you were a geek in high school. Get out of town. I would have never guessed that. <laughs> but it's, it's hard to believe, but it's true. I was too smart for my own good. I was socially awkward, and I was unathletic, and to boot, I grew too quickly so that you could count on it that six months out of the year, my clothes were too small. And the unfortunate truth is that chicks don't dig tall, scrawny, awkward dudes who don't know how to dress themselves. <laughs> so in the social structure of my high school, there were the popular kids, and then there were people like me. And I was one of the unpopular kids who desperately wanted to be cool. I thought that if I could get into the in crowd, then I would be content. And it didn't make me a very nice person. I shunned people who I perceived as being lower on the social ladder than I was. You know, all the other people who didn't have enough money to buy all the right clothes, or all the other members of my chemistry Olympiad team who, in my opinion, were far nerdier than I was. <laughs> and life outside of high school didn't really turn out all that different for me. You know, as time went on, I just found myself replacing popularity with a host of other ultimate goals. Good grades, leading the race in beer bike, getting successful in my career, wealth, fame, and none of those ultimate aims really made me a very good person. Because the problem isn't with high school or the in crowd or rice or academia, the problem is me. The way that I am and the things that I want. And no matter how hard I try, that's not a problem that I can solve because I am the problem. And theistic naturalism doesn't provide any aid here. Because if God merely set the universe in motion and then hung up a sign saying, be back in 25 billion years, then I'm stuck. Whatever I am is whatever I am. And most religions are even less help on this point because they tie our acceptance by God to our ability to accomplish a certain set of tasks or live by a certain set of rules. Only in Christianity does God provide for us the means to change who we are. You see, in Christianity, morality is not a ladder that we ascend to draw close to God. In fact, the whole narrative of Christianity isn't one of people ascending to draw close to God at all. The narrative of Christianity is the narrative of God who came down to us. The same God who set the universe in motion, who gives breath and life to every living thing, that same God provided the means for our transformation in Jesus. And to me, this theistic Christian worldview provides the most satisfying context in which to understand the, how the universe works and where I fit into it. So I've made my arguments that there's a place for Christianity at the table in terms of the discussion of science and how we understand the really big questions in life. Um, that's all I have to say for the evening. Well, it's not all I have to say. It's all I have prepared to say for the evening. Uh, and now we're going to have a time of question and answers. Um, and, we and do we have mics back there? We have mics up here, I can see. Are these the ones we're supposed to use? I think so. So the goal here is that you guys are going to get to ask me questions. So, uh, and I'm going to tell you, don't softball me. Go ahead and ask me hard questions um, and uh, ask me the questions you really want to know the answers to. Um, and I'll do my best to answer them. If I don't have a good answer, I'll be happy to say, I don't have a good answer for you, but let's see. Hi, thank you for speaking today. Um, so you stated that the Christian worldview is the worldview you've chosen to adopt and uh, do science with. So basically, had you been born in Mecca, you would be asking if an Islamic worldview matters in science. Had you been 
born in Bombay, you would be asking if a Hindu worldview matters in science. Whereas theism encompasses many options of worldview, a pure atheism in its essence gives you only one option of worldview. How are you sure that Christianity is the correct faith or the correct religion, given that in part you came to Christianity because of your specific life circumstances and upbringing. Had you been born in, for instance, the mountains of, of Afghanistan, you would probably not be a Christian, and you would be asking very different questions on stage today. Yeah, so yeah, so that's a very good question, because background absolutely does influence our trajectory in life. Um, so, you know, and I agree that, you know, if I had been born in Afghanistan, the probability of me having the framework to, to ask these questions and think about these things would very likely not be there. Now, that doesn't by itself influence the veracity of the claims or not. It just says that, okay, our life experiences ma matter in terms of how we get to things. Um, you know, if I'd been born in the mountains of Afghanistan, I probably wouldn't be at MIT either. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't, you know, I, I, that I don't know, that, know the material necessary to be at MIT. So, you know, in terms of how, I, how do I know uh, that the Christian faith is the right one, well, you know, you know, so I, I tried to make the case that there's really two things about the Christian faith that I think are fairly unique and that resonate for me in terms of my understanding of the world. And the first one is the, transform, the transformation that needs to happen in people. And to my, my view, none of the other major world faiths provide any kind of transformative power that lifts people up. They're all kind of, there's you know, there's, there's guidelines, there's teachings, there's all of these things, but at the end of the day, it's up to me to either do it or not. Um, and, in and in Christianity, there's very much a sense in which the extent to which I'm actually able to do these things is also due to God's help, uh, which very much jives with my own experience where I feel very inadequate to do the things that, that I want to do in life. I, I, I want to do things, I can view what is right, I can see just, and yet I can't quite bring myself to carry it out. And so that conflict that I see in my own life resonates very well with the narrative that Christianity puts forth. The other thing that I feel is very important about Christ that Christianity emphasizes that is not very emphasized in many ethical codes and many theistic traditions is the emphasis on forgiveness. Uh -huh. To put it, put it one way, the Christian God seems to be one who values repentance much more than perfection. Uh, that forgiveness is such an important part of our development as human beings that it's actually built into the Christian moral code. There are admonitions that you must forgive people. Uh, there are even admonitions that go so far as to say that unless you forgive other people, you cannot yourself be forgiven. Uh, and I feel that that emphasis on forgiveness is, is a very deep insight, particularly for the time in which Christianity was developed, which points towards a depth that goes beyond sort of simple socialist, social developments of the time. So those are the, the, the bits of that, uh, that differentiate Christianity for me from other theistic traditions. Uh, I don't know if you watched the, um, I think it was 2008 movie, Expelled. It was narrated by Ben Stein. But it was a, um, one theme that he kind of looked into was this idea of academians who proclaim Christianity as their faith getting blacklisted um, because of their faith, essentially. So I'm wondering if you yourself have personally witnessed that, whether it was discrimination against yourself or against colleagues, uh, just out of curiosity. I, I can say that I, I, have not, I have not witnessed overt discri discrimination against Christians. Um, I would say that the overarching atmosphere in universities today is one of proactive tolerance. Uh, it's a different, it's a particular kind of tolerance where it's tolerance to a point where it's like you can believe what you want to believe as long as I can believe what I want to believe. Um, what I would say is that um, very often I, that there, there are two things that I think feed into this, though, this, this, this feeling that many Christians have of being unwelcome or um, the, uh, so there's two things. So one is there is a minority bias here. So Christians are the minority uh, in academia uh, by, by far. And this is, for many Christians like myself, there are very few aspects in which I am a minority. Uh, but being a Christian in academ academia does make me a minority. Uh, and I hadn't ever come to grips with that until someone brought it up. It's like, well, this is you know, an, a minority. And I was like, oh. And so then I started to take all the things I had in terms of diversity training and minority and say, you know, there are various things that being a minority makes you think. It makes you question. Even if, notable, even if nobody says anything that says you don't belong here, you yourself begin to question whether you belong there. And you begin to act in order to act against that bias and say, no, I really do belong here. 
Um, and I think that there are ways in which this affects Christians in academia, where they feel that they, 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 though no one might say anything, they feel the covert implication that since there aren't any other people like me here, I don't belong here. And so then this causes people to act out in ways that are not uh, conducive to progress. Um, you know, I think the other thing is that a lot of the things that get associated with Christianity, uh, there's a whole bunch of other sociological things that are associated with Christianity, uh, some of which are valid and many of which are not. You know, so there's, there's, I, I remember that one of my colleagues, the one time that he actually connected with the possibility that I was Christian was when he decided that I, since I was Christian that I must also be a Republican. Um, and, uh, and so he wanted me to explain the 2004 election based on the fact that I must understand why people had voted for George Bush. Um, and so I think there is fundamental misunderstanding of this type, uh, where people take social aspects of, you know, you know, of, of things they associate, that either they associate with Christians or that, Chris, that whatever Christians are that are in academia actually have, and they associate that and they put that on Christianity. So I mean, this particular colleague had probably met some strident Republican who was also a Christian and said, well, this is the way that Christians are. They are strident Republicans. And you know, I want to find out Troy's strident Republican viewpoints. Um, uh, and so, I could, so in that particular case, you know, it would be something where you can be a Christian Republican, be a Christian, and not be a Republican. Um, and so you know, any negative stereotype that they had of, of Christians could be based off of something that's actually not technically even really related to being a Christian. Hi. Uh, all right, so that's working. Um, to go off uh, the previous question that you asked, actually, um, about um, there being certain unique aspects of Christianity, um, some of which I'm not sure I entirely agree with that they are unique, but um, the argument about how worldview affects how you enter the lab, um, it seems to be very, the discussion that you've brought to us has been very personal to you. Um, so how the Christian worldview affects um, how you walk into the lab. I'm wondering um, for maybe some of those other uh, belief systems um, that you see as more distant from Christianity and who you may have worked with um, and how they were, their particular worldviews um, affect their research or, or how they work or anything like that because yeah, just to get other yeah, yeah, so, okay. in the picture. So I should say, uh, so thanks for the question. Uh, and I can say that I probably should have given the disclaimer at the beginning. The reason I'm focusing on the Christian worldview is in part because that's the one that I'm an expert at. You know, it's the one that I know the most about. I don't have the credentials to talk very deeply about Buddhism, for example, because I'm, I'm not a Buddhist. I've read some things about Buddhism, but, you know, at the religion 101 level. And so things like say about Buddhism would have not a whole lot of weight because I don't really understand it very deeply. So, that, so part of the reason that I didn't do a, a discourse where I did comparative things is because I'm really not competent to do that. I mean, I've, I've explored, but you know, there are, it's, it's, I think it's offensive sometimes when, when, when people claim scholarship that's not theirs. Um, and I didn't want to claim that scholarship for mine. Um, now, certainly, I, uh, I've met uh, uh, Hindu, Hindus, uh, Hindu academics who are very devout Hindus. Um, and for whom Hinduism and their scientific or um, academic discourse um, fit together very, you know, very, you know hand in glove. Um, uh, I, haven't, I haven't had interaction with a lot of Islamic scientists for whatever reason. Um, I've met a lot of Jewish folks. Uh, I've met um, uh, se several Buddhists. Um, but and again, you know, and I've talked to them some about the things that motivate them to do science and how the things fit together. But I wouldn't say that I understand them well enough that I can reflect back and say, OK, so these are the ways that I see that these other faiths really touch, uh, these, these other world worldviews really touch science. Um, so I will say, this is one of those cases where I'll say, I told you I'd tell you if I don't have a good answer. So I don't have, a, I don't have any better answer than that for you. So. Thank you very much for sharing like a particularly personal story. Um, I think that was very interesting, and above all else, it was particularly honest, the way that you sort of demonstrate how uh, and when effectively faith um, you know, alters the course of your own life. 
I think it would be very refreshing in some sense to hear that honesty from everyone effectively. That is to say that I think that when you make a moral or ethical decision, um, you are effectively reaching out to some kind of faith. And I think that um, in modern dialogue, if you like, um, people have shied away from calling it faith for some reason. Maybe they think it's you know, less, um, it's, it's shakier ground to stand on. But the result of that is that we don't have a lot of dialogue about different um, ways in which we're behaving and the, the beliefs that inform that. Um, how would you say that we go forwards and, and become more honest about that and have a more open dialogue between different faiths, e even if they don't correspond to, if you like, specific religious uh, doctrines? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, I, uh, that's, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, I, I appreciate kind words. Um, and you know, I think that the w one of the ways that we move forward is by being more civil uh, and by respecting one another's viewpoints. Um, because there's a sense in which these things can get to be acrimonious sort of tomato fights where it's, you know, I'm, I have my viewpoint and you have your point and we're just sort of trying to win the argument. Uh, and I think in those things, it becomes very unsafe to share your own actual personal viewpoint. It becomes much safer to pre present a rhetorical argument that's somewhat distant for yourself that you think might, you know, put, you know, keep the, keep the enemies at bay. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that there's much to be gained by that. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that, that we really learn very much uh, about ethics, uh, and it's, it's not certainly the type of person that I want to be in my life. So, um, so I think that you know, having, you know, having civil discussions with other people, and I hope that a forum like this uh, is a place where you guys can have discussions with me. You can also have discussions with each other uh, about these kinds of things that, you know, that, that, that prod us to, to discuss these kinds of questions. Um, um, thank you again uh, for speaking here today. It was a really good talk. Um, my question was, when you talked about what's our role in the universe, uh, I think a lot of people start questioning their role in their relationship with God uh, at the time where, where suffering happens, they see suffering happen. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted you to discuss uh, how you reconcile that, especially when you discuss that if God has a role for everybody and then you see somebody you know, who is born with cerebral palsy or a neurological disorder that doesn't even have the opportunity to understand what religion or much less anything is, uh, you know, how do you reconcile that or why is it fair to them? And mm -hmm. I just wanted you to mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that. So that's a great question. Um, and I certainly in my own life have, have struggled with personal suffering um, and I've struggled with the sufferings of others and sort of the objective suffering uh, of, you know, that seems seems very unfair and there's like there's no cause and, and no justification for it and and you know I, I and i don't have a perfect answer for that i don't always you know there are certainly answers of something where i just have to throw my hands and say i do not know i don't know uh, why why this suffering is it was allowed to happen the one thing i guess there there's one thing though that 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 doesn't really that that has never been something well not never that is not something that now uh, frightens me as far as the Christian faith or the nature of God. Because I have to think about the alternative. So I either think that there's God who loves us and cares for us, and though there is some suffering that I can't understand, at some point he has some purpose for it. Or I have to think that there's not a God, in which case all suffering, whether it seems like it's fair or not, is pointless. And that we're all going to die, and it sucks to be you. Like, that is the alternative. And of those two alternatives, I will take the Christian worldview every day and twice on Sundays because <laughs> it's something, you know, and, and I don't have a complete answer, but it does provide a, a human response to suffering and a human compassion for suffering that is real and true. Um, so that's because in particular in Christianity, we are presented with a God who suffers with us in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, so that it's not as if suffering is thrown off as something that only happens to bad people or is only always justified. It even happened to God himself. Um, I'm going to take up, uh, I guess, uh, again, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm, I'm going to take up the more kind of more traditional atheist uh, viewpoint uh, just for, um, uh, I guess, the idea. So the, the idea is famous, uh, Russell's teapot. So the idea is that um, so you talked a lot about interpretation, and science cannot prove or disprove whether or not God exists. So I'm not going to argue with that, but I, I am going to say yes, but science does say that there are 
definitely better interpretations than others. And the, the idea of Russia's teapot is that, let's just say hypothetically, that there was a, a small teapot that is um, you know, a small teapot, and it's so small that it's in the asteroid belt, but our telescopes are not good enough to actually see the teapot. So the question is, if I say, well, I, I believe there's a teapot there, the question is, um, no one can disprove whether or not that, that, tea, that teapot is actually there. Um, but no one here would say that they believe that there's a teapot there. So the question is, wouldn't it be more honest, in some sense, to admit to yourself that there is no God, and that when I do die, that I will not have an afterlife, and that I still think that even if you admit that, there is still a secular humanist route to admit to that and still believe that you have a, a duty to, to your fellow beings because of a kind of Kantian moral ethics um, in, in some higher sense of the word. Uh, do you have any, a uh, word to say on, on that? Yeah, so, so first of all, I'll say that I, I completely agree with you that from the point of view of ethics, you don't have to believe, you can be an atheist and be, behave, and be very ethical. Um, there are certainly frameworks like Kantian, Kantian frameworks, rationalism, empiricism, that lead to, you could, that if you, if could, you know, for example, if you wanted, you could construct that look very much like Christian ethics. Um, and so I, I, I tried to not say anything to that effect, but if I said anything during the talk that implied that you can't be moral and be an atheist, that was, I, I didn't mean to say that. So, so it's certainly true that from a moral perspective, I agree that you know, being an atheist um, you can be moral, uh, you can, from secular humanism. So that is absolutely true. Um, as to the first part of the question, so, so you can do that. And then the question is, from the point of view of uh, the sort of Russell's teapot analogy, this is actually also the same thing that's behind flying spaghetti monsters. And it was, it was put up as a mockery of saying, well, we could believe that there's a flying spaghetti monster. You can't prove me wrong, so I'm going to believe it. Um, and I would say that that is a reasonable criticism. So that is a reasonable point about a purely theistic God. God as the vanishing point that gives no, has no imprint on the creation. It's just you, there's no evidence. He doesn't touch anything. He's just way out there. Sure, maybe a God exists. Maybe he doesn't. But that's not the God of Christianity. Now, there is the central tenet that God exists. That's the point that I said, okay, well, doesn't, can't be disproven or disproven by science. There are other places where Christianity talks about actual events in history and human lives and in, and in people's hearts and minds. And now there's, they're not things that like, okay, well, you know, the, the, the key things are not things like scientific predictions like the color of my shirt, but they are actual things, things that you know, we can see and touch and have some evidence of. And now there's also scientific evidence that we have to bring to bear on that because you have to evaluate. Well, you know, we have some account of this. We have a scriptural account. We have someone who maybe sometimes someone tells us something or we have our own experience. And do we trust our experience? Do we trust the scripture? Do we trust the person who's giving us the account? And so we have to evaluate those things. But I think the sort of Russell's teapot or flying spaghetti monster is not actually a valid metaphor for the thing that we're describing in Christianity. To some extent, the thing that you're ascribing, that we're doing in Christianity is a little bit more daft in that we're saying that God exists and there is some evidence that makes me think that. Um, and so that's, uh, I, mean, I would say that's for me, you know, if, if it was coming down to, okay, there's no evidence, there's no way I can possibly know anything, then I'd probably be some kind of an agnostic where I'd say, well, you can't know. Uh, maybe there's a God, maybe there's not. There's not, but, there, uh, but, I, but Christian, Christianity is a faith that deals with, deals in evidence. And it's an evidence that has to be interpreted, but there's, there's some evidence there. Hi there. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful speech. And I especially like the part where you said how science can challenge scriptural interpretation, but not scripture. But then I'm wondering, like, what's your opinion on outright miracles that science can't prove yet, like the resurrection? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, a, that's a great question, uh, and I get that question a lot. Um, so there's the biblical examples of miracles, uh, which seem very distant and, you know, okay, Moses parted the Red Sea or the resurrection of Christ. Those seem very far away. But I want to point out that a miracle, there's sort of this post-rationalist interpretation of what a miracle is. 
And if I was to summarize it, my summary of what a miracle is is as follows. A miracle is any time God breaks the laws of physics. That's a miracle. And that is not at all what is meant by a miracle in the Bible, because they didn't know the laws of physics back then. They meant something else. A miracle is something that it doesn't necessarily have to violate the laws of nature. It doesn't have to be completely outside the realm of possibility. A miracle is just a situation where you say, look, I'm presented with something that is either very, very improbable or I outright can't explain. And my simplest explanation for this is that it is a miracle. Now, there may also be some mechanistic explanation, ultimately, for why this happened. But that doesn't, that doesn't exclude the possibility that it was also a miracle. So I can give you a personal example. Uh, my son, Peter, uh, uh, when, he was three, when he was three months old, uh, we took him into the hospital because he had some strange, uh, some strange symptoms. Uh, and he was in the hospital for two weeks. Uh, and they informed us that he had an incurable uh, autoimmune disorder that his immune system was attacking his red blood cells and his platelets and killing them. Uh, and so he was having internal bleeding, uh, and he was suffering from massive anemia. And since it was an autoimmune condition, there was really no way that they could make it go away. They could treat the symptoms. They could suppress the immune response so that he would be OK. But they would have to do that for the rest of his life. And that was devastating for my wife and I, uh, because he's three months old. He's, you know. He's going to be able to like, play football or soccer, or are we going to be padding him up for the rest of his life? And then a year later, we took him in for a blood test. And they did the blood test. And all the antibodies that had been acting against his red blood cells and his platelets were gone. And the doctors said, well, we don't know why they're gone. Uh, it's not anything that we did, but they're gone. And I can't explain that there might be a perfectly mechanistic explanation. Maybe he had some genetic disorder that caused him to manifest this, and then it went away. Or maybe he got exposed to some miraculous thing that would cure this and every person that has it, and he's the only one who was exposed. But that doesn't mean that, to me, that was not a miracle. And I think that miracles in the Bible fall under the same umbrella, where many of these things you could come up with a mechanistic explanation for many of these things, it may be a very outrageous mechanistic explanation, but nonetheless, that doesn't preclude the possibility of it being miraculous. Hi. Um, this is actually kind of a follow-up to the question before last um, in discussing proofs for naturalism versus theism, et cetera. And something that's been on my mind over the past couple of days is the difference between, like you said, theistic naturalism and theistic Christianity. And so my question is, on a very practical level, is there any way that we can live our lives in 2014 um, to experimentally interact with this divine being, if he is true or not. Um, is there a way that we can almost run our own experiment? Yes. Um, I, I, so that's a great question, because I mean, as a scientist, I like to experiment. right? I like to have, I, ideally, I like to have a control experiment and a not control experiment. Um, I can't necessarily give you a control in this scenario. but. Scripture does actually talk about testing our faith. I mean, it uses that exact phrase, testing your faith. And that's not, not now, sometimes it talks about God testing our faith. That's a different thing. It talks about us testing our own faith. And you can, in context, say, well, what do they actually mean by that? The way that you, that, that you test your faith is you act as if you believe. So you say, if I believed, what would I do? And then you see how that pans out. Um, because, you know, the, because there's a sense in which, okay, well, if it's true, then if I do these things, then something should happen. I should notice some change in myself. That's the scriptural teaching is that I should notice some change in me if I follow, you know, if I follow along and follow Christ. And I'll say that, you know, in terms of things that I would suggest in terms of testing your faith, I would give a few uh, bits, of, bits of advice. One is that uh, Christian faith is not meant to be Lone Ranger type stuff. Uh, you know, there's a reason that God came down in the form of a person. It's because we communicate best with other people. Um, 
So it's not, it's not something where I'm expected to go into my, into, my, into my closet and close the door and get out my Kindle and start reading books or you know, just praying. And that's just how it's supposed to happen. Um, Christianity is, 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 a, is a religion that has to do with people interacting with people, asking each other questions, thinking about things, and then trying to experience and seek after God together. And so if you're interested in doing something like that, I, I encourage you to seek out some other people who are like-minded and want to do that experiment. Uh, and then do the experiments together and then hold each other accountable. So you, you do things and then you have to have people, and the reason the people are important is because then you report back what you found. Because um, certainly there are some times in Christianity where people uh, have suggested what I would call ridiculous uh, testings of their, of, of their faith. Um, and, uh, and you know, like they, they'll, they'll, they'll make, they'll, 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 they'll say, do this and see what happens. And I'm like, I would never promise that because what if God didn't do what he said he was going to do? Um, but they'll, they'll say these things and then they'll share that, okay, well, and people will come back and say, actually, I know it was right. It, it turned out that way. Um, and so my advice is to, to get together with people, ask questions, and then behave in such a way as if you think it is true and see if it causes any type of change in your, your view of the world or the way that you do things. Because for me, the way that this worked was, I think always as a scientist, the thing that stands in, stood in the way of me feeling like I had faith was the idea that somehow faith meant the absence of doubt. And as a scientist, I never get to the point of having an absence of doubt. I always have doubts. And Christian faith, however, is not the absence of doubts. Christian faith is the ability to act in the presence of doubts. And so the activity of doing the thing convinced me that, well, whether I had doubts or not, I still did it. And so I must have at least some modicum of faith to have at least done it. And that gave me some confidence that I wasn't completely devoid of this faith thing that God seemed to think was so important. One final question. Um, yes, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to do this. In light of the beginning of the discussion, you asking us about Genesis 1, I'd just like to ask you, as a scientist and as a Christian, what is your interpretation of Genesis 1? Fair enough. So I, I typically avoid, so I want to reiterate what my major point was, and then I will answer. Okay, so it's, fair, it's a fair question. I'll answer it, because I can't answer it. There's not any, but I want to reiterate what my major point is, which is my major point is that my interpretation is an interpretation. Okay, I've, I think I've done it right. I'm mostly, I'm convinced that I've got it right, but... There are other Christians who think different things than me. There are other very learned Christians who think different things than me on all different manner of issues, and they all have their own interpretations, their, their own interpretation schools. And the thing that I want to emphasize is that I don't want you guys coming away from this saying, you see, finally I found a Christian who agrees with me, or, oh, I hated that because there was a Christian there who disagreed with me. And it's like, well, you know, that's, that's the way it is. We interpret things differently. So that's my take home is, Let's not have that dialogue generally, okay? So you guys all agree that we won't have that dialogue generally? Okay, so here's my take on Genesis 1. So the, of course the key question is, let's just focus on the key question, how old is the universe? Let's focus on that key question. So if you take the Genesis account as a scientific style account and you add up all the years, the Earth and the universe are about 6,000 years old. And I have difficulty with that because scientific evidence says that well, if you look at this, the, uh, the evidence, the universe is some number of billion years old. So sometimes I like to joke that I'm not 38, but I'm actually 10 billion, because when I was born, the universe was four, four and a half billion years old, and now it's 14 and a half billion years old. So, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, scientific evidence points towards the universe being much, much older than that. Now, a bad interpretation of scripture, or a bad interpretation of science, would be to pit those against each other and say, well, I trust the scripture more, the earth is 6,000 years old. Or I trust the science more, the earth is 14.5 billion years old. Because that, doesn't, that, that just discards one piece of evidence in favor of another. And that's not actually the way that I approach things. Instead, I take a holistic view of saying, how do I take these two things and put them together? What do they teach me about God and how I should interpret the scriptures? And one thing that really strikes me is that if the, if the universe is 6,000 years old, well, one of the things that we have is light from stars that are more than 6,000 light years away. 
So that means that when the universe was created, it was created with light in transit through space to strike the Earth now, halfway between whatever star that's actually 6,000 years old but appears to be several billion years old and the Earth. Now that's a pretty significant trick. And it would indicate that God wanted to confuse us. That he wanted us to think the universe was older than it is. It would indicate that God's kind of a trickster, kind of like Loki. And that is, <laughs> and that is not consistent with the rest of Scripture. So the rest of Scripture does not present a God who is a trickster, who wants to confuse us. God is a God who wants to reveal himself to us and who wants to be known by us. And the main problem is that he's just really, really hard to comprehend. And so the fact that the interpretation of the universe being 6,000 years old and there being these phenomena that seem to point towards the universe being older than that makes me lean towards the conclusion that the universe is probably older than 6,000 years because it's consistent with the scripture, more consistent with the scripture, and more consistent with the scientific evidence. Now, that doesn't mean that the universe couldn't be 6,000 years old. The universe could be 6,000 years old. It could be six minutes old. God could have created the universe together with all of our memories of having sat through such an enjoyable Veritas forum. <laughs> but to me, the most, most plausible explanation is that the universe is, is much older. So, all right, so I think you take it over. Oh, one more question. Oh, you're taking over then. All right, thank you. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.